Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're going to give it a couple minutes to fill the room here. Good afternoon again, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to give it just a couple of minutes to get the room filled. Again, everyone, thank you for joining us. We'll give it about 30 more seconds to fill the room. Great, looks like we can get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks again for joining us for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on what's ahead for advocacy in 2021. My name is Brett Spitali and I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will pose to the panel after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, January 22nd. I'd like to introduce our panelists today. Nathan Schaefer is the Vice President of Public Policy at NHF. Joanna Gray is, is a principal partner with Artemis Policy Group. Marla Feinstein is a senior policy and healthcare analyst at NHF. And Dylan Harp is the government relations specialist at NHF. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. And I will now th turn things over to Joanna to get us started. Joanna. Thank you so much. Um, I am so happy to be with everyone today. Um, I live and work in Washington, DC, and I am very pleased that it is a beautiful and safe um, inauguration day. The perfect day to talk about what is coming next for advocacy. So for my part of today's presentation, I'll spend a few minutes giving an overview of the 2020 election results, um, but then really get to, so what does that mean? What's on the agenda for Congress um, at the start of the year? What will the Biden administration take on? And then what will NHF be advocating for with both groups? Um, so first, of course, for, um, for president, um, President Joe Biden won. Um, you can see the map here. This is from the Washington Post. Um, and it, the, as you would expect, you know, the color of the state shows who um, the electors went to. And you can see that there were a handful of states with little white arrows. Um, and those are states that President Trump won um, four years ago, but, but did not win in 2020. Um, for the Senate, um, this, this is a map that has just been updated as of two weeks ago when the special elections in the state of Georgia happened. Um, and so what is pretty exciting and pretty rare is that um, as a result of the election, both back in November and then a few weeks ago in January, um, the Senate is split 50-50, totally even, um, between Democrats and independents who caucus with Democrats and Republicans. Um, I'm going to talk um, a little bit about kind of what that means um, and how Congress will be governed when it's 50-50. Um, but suffice it to say, it will be an interesting year um, with the, the party um, margin so close in the Senate. Um, this shows what happened in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, the Democrats maintain control of the House as they did in the last Congress. So you can see that they lost nine seats. Um, and so again, the, um, the margin is narrowing in the House as well. Um, there will be some more change in the House because um, there are some current uh, representatives who have uh, taking new positions in the Biden-Harris administration, and so they will leave Congress and there will be new elections to fill their seats. Um, each state has different rules about the timing for when that, that um, election might happen, so there will be times this year that we don't have 435 um, representatives as that process plays out. Um, so what is on the Biden-Harris administration agenda? So again, they were inaugurated 
I guess just about two hours ago. Um, and at the start of every presidential administration is the 100 day sprint, the 10 day sprint, you know, what am I going to accomplish on my first day? Um, you know, uh, presidents and pre presidential candidates and presidents elect spend a lot of time talking about what they're going to tackle right at the beginning. It's they have kind of the most um, oomph, te technical uh, political term there, or, or momentum right at the beginning. Um, and often what a president does um, in his or her first 100 days um, kind of sets the tone for the rest of their administration. President Biden has announced um, what will be a 10-day sprint to enact a number of changes by executive order. And he has identified what he's calling four interrelated crises that his administration will seek to um, enact reform on quickly. So that uh, the COVID-19 crisis, the resulting economic crisis coming from COVID-19, um, climate change, and racial inequity. Um, the pr President Biden is expected to sign 17 executive orders later this afternoon to get this started. And I think we'll be seeing a lot out of the White House in, um, in the next 10 days. Um, there will be a longer process to change other policies. So the things that kind of we as NHS most care about around the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and um, access to Medicaid, things like that, um, I do anticipate we will see a lot of policy change in that area, hopefully positive, um, but that will be a longer term process. Um, the other thing that's on this slide, the, the blue Biden-Harris transition letter, that is um, President-elect Biden announced last week the American Rescue Plan, which is his first big COVID package. Um, it's almost $2 trillion and it seeks to provide both financial support for families, individuals and families who are suffering uh, because of COVID as well as more funding for states and local governments to get the vaccine out, et cetera. Um, he can't implement that on his own, that will go to Congress and I expect that will be kind of the first, um, first big kind of big ticket item that he will try to work with Congress to enact. Um, the other thing new administrations bring are lots of new faces. Um, so this shows just uh, the first uh, members of um, the Department of Health and Human Services that uh, has jurisdiction over healthcare policy. We have a lot of advocacy um, kind of aimed at these folks. Um, uh, Javier Becerra is the nominee for the Secretary of Health and Human Services. He has, was a member of Congress for a long time and most recently was the Attorney General of California um, where he led the states that are trying to protect the Affordable Care Act. Um, so I think kind of the patient community generally thinks that we are likely to have a friend um, in Secretary Becerra if he is confirmed. Um, you can see the other folks here. Um, I love that picture of Dr. Fauci wearing his Nationals mask. Um, he is a huge fan of the Washington Nationals, as am I. Um, he will be staying on in his role um, at the NIH, as well as advising um, the now Biden-Harris administration on uh, tackling COVID. So what will happen in Congress? Um, so as I mentioned, there is a very close margin in both chambers. The three new senators um, elect and designate. So the two from Georgia, Senators Ossoff and Warnock, and then a new senator from California to replace Vice President Harris, um, Senator Padilla, will all be sworn in this afternoon. And then we end up with this 50-50 split. As vice president, um, the, the whoever's vice president also serves as president of the Senate. So that means that Vice President Harris will uh, cast a tie-breaking vote. If there are ever votes that are all the Democrats on one side, all the Republicans on the other, um, she will be able to cast the, the tie-breaking vote. And so that's what will give Democrats control of Congress. There will be Democrats now who are um, in the leadership of the Senate, as well as committee chairs. Um, that, so that's a party swap from um, the last several years. So when the margins, whenever it comes to the Senate um, or congressional legislating more generally, um, 
policy making usually has to be bipartisan. That is due to the rules for how the House and Senate function. Um, and I know um, if you watch the inauguration, President Biden talked a lot about his desire for unity and to bring everyone together. And so he's hoping, for example, that the vote for the COVID package he released last week will be bipartisan and will have broad support um, from both parties. So I think that's the, the kind of first hope. If there are these close margins, are there incentives for the parties to work together? Um, there's also will be pressure for members of each party to stay with their, so Democrats to kind of stay with the Democratic Party, Republicans to stay with their Republican Party. So what that really means is there's about you know, five or 10 senators who are the most moderate Democrats and the most moderate Republicans, who everybody is going to be trying to get to join their side. Um, so you will be seeing a lot in the news about what, say, Senator Manchin from West Virginia, who is a, Demo a moderate Democrat, thinks about things, or moderate Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski from Alaska. Um, so if you live in one of those states who's represented by one of the moderate senators, you um, your senator will have even more power. And um, I would argue we'll need to hear even more loudly from you about what um, policies you think would be best. Um, you know, unfortunately, when it comes to Congress, there's also always the chance for gridlock, you know, that the parties won't be able to agree um, and that, you know, policymaking won't happen. Um, especially with respect to COVID, you know, I'm optimistic that they will be able to come together on another package. They passed several big bills last year to try to um, help the country respond to the COVID public health emergency. Um, I think the effects, of, the political effects of the, the riot and the siege of the Capitol a few weeks ago um, are lingering with a potential um, impeachment trial coming up in the Senate from former, for former President Trump, um, as well as a number of investigations, a lot of finger pointing all around. And so um, while there's a desire, I think, among congressional leaders to work together, I think we'll have to see how, how far that goes. Um, What's good for us is that the issues that we most care about are bipartisan. Um, the Bleeding Shores community has always had friends and champions on both sides of the aisle, and I expect that that will continue. And of course, we also know among members of our community, there are broad, there's a broad range of political beliefs. Um, and NHF is not a political organization. You know, our job is to work with members of Congress and the president, whoever they are, um, to try and advance policy for the community. Um, as I mentioned, the switch for the Democrats having control of the Senate um, means that they will be the leaders and the, um, the chairs of committees, they will be able to set the priorities for what bills come before and, and what comes to the floor. Um, the second half of the slide has a handful of uh, likely policy issues. Um, on a lot of these, there have been bipartisan progress on, um, for example, drug pricing. There was a bipartisan bill that passed out of the Senate Finance Committee last year. Um, I know that Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon, who's the chair of the Finance Committee this year, um, really wants to pick that up again, see if he can tackle high drug prices. Um, the expansion of access to telehealth during the COVID public health emergency, I think most um, patients and providers have seen as a real positive change. And so there will be um, effort to expand um, or make permanent the, the expansions that happened during COVID. Um, and then I think, you know, tackling health disparities um, has been a, a growing issue, I think, for lots of policymakers over the last few years. And it's something, again, that um, President Biden mentioned in his inaugural address today and, and seeks to, to try and improve um, early on. Um, we will be closely monitoring everything that, that Congress is up to and doing our best to advocate on behalf of the community. In a few minutes, we'll talk a little more about Washington Days um, and how you can get involved in our advocacy. Um, one last kind of wonky Senate um, thing, because I think you will see this in the news a lot. 
um, and it's super, it's super wonky, um, the budget reconciliation process. So typically Senate bills have to have two thirds majority to be able to cut off debate and avoid a filibuster. But there are certain bills that can pass the Senate using the budget reconciliation process. And so they only need 51 votes. If you'll remember, Senate is split 50-50 with Vice President Harris, could be a 51st vote. Um, so if the parties aren't able to work together on um, issues, say, related to the Affordable Care Act, it's been, it's been awfully difficult to reach bipartisan agreement on that um, in the last 10 years, then um, they could try to pass bills using this process and only have have democratic support. The tricky thing is there's something called the Byrd Rule, which is named after Senator Byrd, a former senator from West Virginia, whose picture is on your slide. Um, every single provision in a bill under this process has to affect the federal budget, either in terms of revenues or spending. So you can't pass anything using this process. It's, it's more constrained and there are some technical rules around it. Um, but since the, the votes came in in Georgia and it was clear that now the Senate would be split 50-50, um, folks in Washington are doing a lot of talking about, well, what provisions related to the Affordable Care Act or drug pricing or, um, and not just healthcare, of course, and the environment and transportation and education um, can happen via budget reconciliation. I think we'll see a lot more on that um, in the next few months, again, as we see how um, partisanship or bipartisanship starts to take shape um, in the Senate this year. Um, I'll close with just two slides about NHS. Um, this is a slide that I have presented um, and lots of kind of Washington updates just to give a broad overview of NHS federal policy agenda. Um, you can see it falls into four buckets. And I think what's most important for community members to know is um, we really do try to influence policy um, throughout the federal government whenever it affects um, access to care, blood and product safety, um, hemophilia treatment centers, or uh, the programs really targeted at the bleeding disorders community for research, surveillance, and outreach. Um, and then in the gray side of the boxes are just a handful of the federal agencies that we work with on those issues. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about access to care. I think for obvious reasons, but want to make sure community members know that our our federal agenda really is quite broad. Um, and then finally, for my last slide, um, where are we headed in the, the next, let's say, 100 days? Um, we will be doing lots of advocacy with the new Congress and the Biden administration with respect to access to care issues. That is where um, we know so many community members continue to have trouble um, accessing good insurance, affording their out-of-pocket costs associated with their, their treatment, et cetera. And it's where that under the Trump administration, there were a number of policy changes that could hinder, hinder that access. Um, so we joined with about 35 other leading patient advocacy groups to release a um, 100 days agenda, which has been sent to the Biden folks. Um, that really lays out all of the policy changes that need to happen quickly, we hope, um, to improve access to care. And you can see at the link below um, if you're interested in looking in the, the weeds of the document. Um, and then finally, my colleague Marla will talk in just a second about the Hemophilia SNF Access Act, and we will be working on its implementation as well, which is very exciting. Um, and with that, I am pleased to turn it over to my colleague, Nathan, who will take it from here. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate your interest and your enthusiasm. I have to be honest, when we first set the date for this webinar, we did not even realize that it was going to coincide with the date for the inauguration. And then when we realized how much interest and enthusiasm there has been in recent weeks on what is happening in Washington, DC, we thought it made perfect sense. And it was ideal timing because we are coming up on our largest landmark advocacy event of the year, which is Washington Days. If you've been to Washington Days before, you know it is a very exciting time for over 400 community advocates to convene in Washington, DC, receive the latest training and to be up and go and visit with representatives on Capitol Hill. 
Um, so we know it's really exciting and we desperately want to be able to do that in person with all of you as soon as is safely possible. That is not the case right now. So for Washington Days during the first week of March, we will be completely virtual. And we wanted to just give you um, this afternoon a little bit about what to expect if you're going to plan to participate in Washington Days. And if you haven't yet committed to participating in Washington Days, our task this afternoon is to convince you to do so. If in the past you've not been able to come to Washington Days because it's been cost prohibitive, or if because your chapter can only send a finite number of participants, then you're in luck. This year, we are open to all community members and we really encourage as much participation as possible. So here's a little bit about what to expect. When we get together on the 1st of March, which will be that Monday afternoon, we will go through an extensive training on the issues, which we'll talk about momentarily. Um, we will also cover best practices for social media and how to engage um, in the most productive way with congressional offices. On Tuesday, March 2nd, your state team will be assigned to an NHF staff member. And that is really critical because your NHF staff member assigned to your team is going to be hosting the Zoom meetings that you'll be having with congressional offices either on March 3rd or March 4th. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Let me be clear, if you're coming from a state, you'll be paired with other people from your state unless you're only one or two people from your respective state, in which case we will pair you with a neighboring state so that you will have a larger number of people within your group. And we'll talk more about the group assignments and what to expect um, in a little while. Your congressional visits will likely all take place on either Wednesday, March 3rd or Thursday, March 4th. We haven't gotten to the point of assigning, of, of um, confirming legislative visits yet um, because registration is still open. And I'll talk more about that momentarily. What I want you to know at this point is you can expect that your meetings will take place throughout either that Wednesday or that Thursday. They will not be back to back. You will likely have a handful of visits, which is the same experience when you come to Washington. You can expect to meet with both of your um, Senate offices, as well as your respective congressional member of the House. The final day of our experience together will be on Friday, March 5th, and that's when we do a state and local advocacy training. That'll take place between 12 and 2 o'clock Eastern time, and Dylan's going to talk a little bit more about what that training has covered in the past and what to expect this year. A couple of points about registration. Um, all chapters are expected to send at least two representatives for the duration of the conference. That is the case every single year and there is no exception this year, even though we will be virtual. Um, like I mentioned, this is open to all community members, uh, board members of NHF, industry partners as well, though I will say industry partners are not able to participate in the legislative visits on Capitol Hill but there is ample opportunity for industry partners to come and participate in the trainings and have some interactions with community members throughout our week together. Registration is currently open, but is closing soon. On the 5th of March is the deadline for registration for Washington Days. Marla just posted in the chat the link to do so. So please wait until we're done with the webinar and then go ahead and register yourself if you haven't done so already. It is really critical that we have advance notice of who's planning to participate because what we need to do is figure out who is your member of Congress and we need to go about scheduling those visits. One of the things I will mention that's not on the slide here is um, we always stress that if you've got a new member of the House or the Senate, please, please participate in Washington Days because the sooner we establish relationships with new members of Congress and they're able to connect directly with their constituents constituents, those relationships have proven to be the most productive as possible. The earlier you meet a new member of Congress, the greater your likelihood is going to be of having impact on that congressional office. We've sent notices to anyone who lives in a state with a brand new U.S. Senator, with the exception of California, because that just happened this week, um, so that is forthcoming. If you don't know if you've got a new member of the House yet, please don't share that publicly and figure out whether or not you have a new member of, um, of the House of Representatives. When you go to register, you are required to put in your nine digit zip code. That gives us the ability to really hone in on who is your member of Congress because some zip code there's overlap in terms of the congressional office that would be representing where you live. 
So if you don't know if you have a new member of Congress, please find out. And um, if so, please, please plan to participate in Washington Days. The final thing I'll say on this slide is that we will also, as we have done in years past, have uh, training webinars on the 16th of February. This will give folks a little bit of time to hear in greater detail what to expect, how to prepare, and what to bring to your meetings when you're meeting with the congressional offices the first week of March. As we've done for the past couple of years, we're going to have two different webinars, one for people who have never been to Washington Days before or have only been once, and the other will be for people who have been two or more times, and we'll explain why that is as we get a little further into the presentation. So with that, I think we're going to go to the next slide, and I think this is the one about skilled nursing facilities, which um, I'm going to let my colleague Marla Feinstein walk us through this one, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Nathan. So it is my great pleasure. So one of the first issues I worked on at NHF was, in fact, um, skilled nursing facilities and the access issues that um, come along with that, right? So I'm super happy that we did enact the Hemophilia SNF Access Act. And um, in that it was included in the giant consolidated appropriations act that was signed at the end of the year this is just that giant end of year relief package that was passed in congress late in december and ultimately signed into law the one caveat with that is although the act was signed and passed it doesn't start until october of uh, uh october 1st 2021 so in several months and as you may recall, the original legislation was just targeting this one specific problem. And it was bipartisan and in both chambers. Uh, it had companion legislation in the House and Senate. In the Senate, which were, it was introduced in January of 2020, it had um, bipartisan, again, um, Menendez from New Jersey, NC from Wyoming and White House um, from Rhode Island. And in the House, which was introduced just days before Washington days, um, it was um, LaHood from Illinois, Higgins and Jingle and Bill Arrakis. And as you know, why, as you may recall, why it was needed in the first place is that Medicare beneficiaries are unable to access skilled nursing facilities and that they were, want, were unable to be placed. And that, it turns out, was because of how skilled nursing facilities were being reimbursed. And what this act does is it allows for the treatment the factor or, what, or any treatment for that matter to be billed for separately within Medicare and skilled nursing facilities. In this way, it, allow, it improves access for Medicare beneficiaries for skilled nursing facilities. While this may seem like a super small policy change, it is ultimately gonna have a huge impact on our community members as we are fortunate enough to have community members naturally aging into Medicare. So as those, um, members at, um, age into Medicare, we expect that there's gonna be more people that will benefit from this act. And none of this would have been possible if not for the 450 people who advocated for this on the Hill during Washington days last year. And I'm super sad that we don't um, get to be there together in person this year, but I am so very grateful. And uh, on behalf of NHF, we wanted to thank you for all of your work on this and with that, I am going to turn it back over to Nathan. Thank you, Marla. Um, and I just wanted to publicly thank you, Marla, for all of your work on the SNF issue. I know it's been a labor of love for many, many years. And for all of my fellow social workers out there, I know that this has been reported as a primary concern of so many patients. So I know that this has been years and years in the making. And this is sort of the nature of the beast when you do policy and advocacy work. You can be doing work and planning to do more and more work. We had plans to make incremental progress in the 117 Congress on this bill, and lo and behold, it became law, which means we have to rejudge our plans and figure out what we need to prioritize for Washington days, which is a very good problem to have. So like Marla said, thank you all to the community members who helped support that initiative. We are very, very thrilled it went through. So in terms of our issues and what we're gonna be talking about this year, we don't have all the details yet, but we can give you a preview of what to expect. First of all, it'll be the first week in March, which of course is Bleeding Disorders Awareness Month. So we will be talking about the importance of raising awareness with all um, members of elected offices. And I already talked about the importance of establishing relationships with new members of Congress. Keep in mind, new members of Congress likely don't know many people, if any people, 
who have bleeding disorders. So you might be their first line of defense and their first line of education into what it's like to live with a bleeding disorder. And how perfect and fitting can that be if it's coming from a constituent who can speak about what it's like to live with a bleeding disorder? Your goal in a scenario like that is for them to keep you in mind in the event that issues that impact bleeding disorder patients come up down the road. You want them to be calling you for information. And if they do and you don't know the information, your chapter, NHF, HFA will be partners to get them that information. So of course, awareness and relationship building will be paramount among our priorities this year. We will, again, as we always do, talk about the importance of federal funding to support bleeding disorder programs. And that pertains to um, initiatives at the CDC, at the Department of Health and Human Services, and importantly, research initiatives at the National Institutes of Health. This is something we do every year. Um, we will have the specific amount of funding that uh, we have experienced in years past and what we would like to see protected from the appropriations process this year. We are all of you with those information, with that information and with those numbers in advance of your congressional visits. Joanna already alluded to this, but in terms of the patient protections inherent in the Affordable Care Act, we are going to be paying very careful attention to any kind of activities at the Supreme Court or any kind of legislation that may be introduced. We've seen a few sort of stabilization bills that really aim to codify the patient protections inherent in the ACA, and we've supported many of those. I do not anticipate this year we will see as many repeal and replace pieces of legislation that we experienced in the year 2017. If you were with us during Washington days or many Washington days that year, you remember we had to do a lot of defense on the ACA when it came to congressional action. I don't anticipate those kind of threats, but we may be seeing some kind of legislation that has impact on the Affordable Care Act, in which case, of course, we'll be talking about that. The good news is our patient community is very familiar with defending the ACA and I have every confidence we'll be able to do so again this year. We finally are looking at out-of-pocket expenses. Um, we recognize our, our uh, medications are very, very expensive and oftentimes put patients in very difficult predicaments about how they're going to pay for their medication or other aspects of their life and their livelihood. One of the things that we're paying very careful attention to is the potential for uh, renewed legislation around accumulator adjusters. That may be, um, there, there was a bill in the last Congress and there's some desire to sort of um, renew and revamp that. So we anticipate hopefully before we all convene together in early March, we'll have a better sense of where that pending legislation is, in which case we will make it a priority when we all convene uh, virtually in Washington. Next slide, please. So I wanna um, just give you a little bit about what to expect. And this really pertains to those of you who have never done this before. As you can see, this is an image of a congressional office and that's our former CEO Val Bias. Um, as, as you probably have heard or might anticipate, often when you convene in these offices, they're a somewhat casual environment. Sometimes you're meeting around a coffee table, sometimes you're sitting on couches, sometimes you're meeting in the hallway. None of that is going to be the experience this year. But what I want to stress is that you will be having conversations. These are not presentations. You will not be going in with PowerPoint presentations. You'll be meeting similar to this format, though you'll likely be able to see the image of each of the participants. Um, but you'll be meeting over Zoom. And I can tell you, having done a number of um, sort of DC days for other organizations, congressional staff members do turn on their cameras. So don't anticipate you're just gonna be having a phone call. They're gonna be looking at you and interacting with you. Next slide, please. So how does it work? I already went through um, the sort of schedule and, and all of the expectations. We'll be giving you the advanced training in the middle of February. We'll be giving you advanced materials when you get your schedule, which you'll get the Saturday before Washington days. Um, and you'll have ample time to meet with your team, which we'll talk about. And um, you'll be able to prepare sufficiently for your virtual meetings. And like I alluded to already, we'll conclude with the state and local advocacy training on that Friday afternoon. So that's sort of the breakdown of what to expect. Next slide, please. 
I want to stress that you'll have ample time to practice with your team. Like I said, you're going to get all of the information. You're going to get the training on Monday afternoon. And at some point on Tuesday afternoon, you're going to convene with those that you will be gathered with when you have your virtual Zoom meetings with congressional offices. And this time to practice with your team is really, really essential. What I always tell people going into congressional visits is you need a game plan of who's going to talk about what and in what order, because you can't all talk about the same thing and you can't talk over one another. That kind of structure and preparation is even more important in a virtual environment because you're not going to have the body language to look across the table and give eyes, you know, to Rosanette, who's featured here to say, hey, you're up next. You know what I mean? You're going to have to have uh, a comprehensive and strategic plan about who's going to talk about what and in what order. We will provide you with sufficient time for you to be able to do that with your team. And like I mentioned, you'll be assigned to an NHF staff member to help shepherd you through the process. Next slide, please. We want to stress that you'll never be alone. This is an image of quite a number of advocates from the state of New York and who's the new majority leader, uh, Chuck Schumer featured there. Um, like I mentioned, if you're the only person and there's only two people from your state, we'll pair you with another state. You'll always have an NHF staff member or volunteer who will be there with you. You'll never be alone going into these visits. And I wanna stress that for people who've never done this before, you're not going to be going in alone. I also just wanna stress briefly, you also don't need to know everything going into these visits. They might ask you a question, well, how many people with hemophilia live in the state of Arkansas? And you might not know, and that's okay. You just say, I don't know, but I will find out and I will get back to you, which gives you an opportunity to go find that information and come back to the congressional office. Because like I said earlier, your goal is to become a resource to a congressional office. So if you don't know the answer to a question, that's great. You can figure out the answer to the question and get back to them with reliable and comprehensive information. Next slide, please. Um, I, I want to stress that, um, and this is, again, for folks who've never been to Washington Days before, sometimes they're disappointed if they're not able to meet directly with their member of Congress. Members of Congress have a lot of um, staff and um, aides that help them in, in their work as a member of Congress. Members of Congress have to know a little bit about a lot of things but they don't have to be experts. They're not experts in healthcare, but they have assigned staff members who are experts in healthcare and the way that we structure healthcare in the United States. So don't be disappointed if you meet with a staff or an aide of a congressional office. Honestly, they're very, very capable and they're very smart and they can get a lot done often behind the scenes. They often tend to be pretty young and that bright and enthusiastic and we certainly encourage that but don't be thrown off if you're meeting with someone who looks to be 25 or younger. These are really hard jobs. They do not pay very well, but they attract very, very smart and capable people. So please treat them just as you would a member of Congress in the event that you're meeting with a uh, member of their staff. Next slide, please. I want to stress that you're there to share your story you're not there to be an expert in healthcare. You're not there to be an expert in the litigation surrounding the Affordable Care Act. You're there to talk about what you and your family have experienced living with the bleeding disorders and nothing more. Again, if you get questions about anything that comes up in the meetings and you don't know, we will help you identify an answer to those questions. You're simply there to talk about your story and what your family has gone through. Next slide, please. We want to um, remind you that kids are great storytellers. Um, and we've seen, as you can see here, a young boy with hemophilia demonstrating to Senator Susan Collins what it's like for him to infuse. Um, a lot of congressional offices don't know what it means to infuse medication. So sometimes kids can talk about that. Sometimes kids can simply show their port. You know, what they say, a picture says a thousand words, right? A kid showing their port conveys a lot about the complexity and the severity of what it's like to live with a bleeding disorder. So we encourage you to bring your kids to your congressional visits. Keep in mind, you're in charge of their behavior. You're in charge of what they share. You're in charge of your camera angle to make sure you can see them. And we can help you troubleshoot when you get together with your teams on that Tuesday afternoon. Um, we can't provide any kind of childcare or anything like that. But we do encourage you, if your kids are old enough to be able to engage in a conversation like that, even if it's only for a couple of minutes, um, please keep in mind that kids are great storytellers. Next slide, please. Things you can bring along with you. Um, again, uh, 
people don't understand what it's like to infuse with clotting factor, nor do they understand just how costly it is. So as you can see here, and, and some of this I think is expired factor, but it indicates the cost of each vial of medication. That can be a very telling educational moment when you give a congressional office, here's the vial of medication that I have to take three times a week. And each one of these costs $3,500 or whatever it may be. That can be very illustrative and very educational for congressional offices. Also keep in mind, you can bring photos and I know we're gonna be in a virtual format. So it's not the easiest thing to like get out your phone and show them a, a photo on your phone, but you can do it. Might need a little bit of practice, but if you've got a photo of a particularly difficult bleeding episode, or perhaps when your child learned how to infuse when they were at summer camp, things like that, that demonstrate milestones of what it's been like to live with a bleeding disorder can be very helpful in educating congressional offices about what it's like to live with and thrive with a bleeding disorder. Next slide, please. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dylan Harp, who one of my colleagues that work on the state um, government relations team, but I'll be back hopefully to answer some questions in a little while. Again, thank you all for your participation today. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Um, as Nathan mentioned, I'm a government relations specialist at NHF. Uh, I cover about 16 states working on uh, state public policy and advocacy, uh, and I'm currently based in Dallas, Texas. Um, I just wanted to go over a few more things and then we'll get to, uh, to some questions. Uh, as Nathan mentioned earlier, um, the March 5th at Friday training is our advocacy training. Um, it's normally an event that we always look forward to. Um, it's a great time. Normally, it's the day after um, we've been on the Hill meeting with our, our elected officials and their, uh, and their staff. Um, obviously, with Washington Days this year being virtual, we um, are, this advocacy training will be looking a little bit different. Um, uh, for example, though, last year, uh, we were really honored and um, ecstatic to have um, Representative Randy Kleitz speak to us. Um, if you don't know Randy, um, she's a super amazing person, a super uh, amazing woman. Uh, Randy was elected in 2018 to represent Ohio's uh, 75th House District, um, and she's also a member of the bleeding disorder community. Um, so it was great. We spent about an hour with her, um, and we actually had some of our, um, our young adults in our NYLI program that asked her a, a really a laundry list of questions that ranged from um, how she got involved in politics to her time in office. Um, and it was a really neat, uh, really neat experience. Um, after uh, Randy spoke, we then had the opportunity to break up into small groups. Uh, some of the small groups were led by NHF staff members. Some were led by community leaders, chapter EDs. Uh, we discussed a wide range of topics, everything from uh, how to grow your advocacy base to testifying in public. Um, so it was a really, really neat experience. I know that I learned a lot um, hearing from some of the participants. I believe that they learned a lot as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so just a few more quick things about this advocacy training that'll be Friday. Obviously, again, it will be virtual. Um, again, things will be looking differently this year, um, but uh, we are going to have a robust agenda with a lot of uh, fun times, a lot of interesting topics. So please come prepared. Uh, please come prepared to share and to learn um, from your colleagues. Um, two quick reminders about this training. Again, each chapter is required to have two representatives attend the entire meeting. We will be able to keep track of that, um, who's in attendance and who um, stayed through the duration. Um, and then finally as well, um, two lucky participants will also be receiving a Grubhub gift card as well. That will be chosen um, at random and the winners will be notified after the fact. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so these next uh, three slides, I believe, um, are going to be around phone to action. This may be something that hopefully you've seen or heard about. Um, phone to action is a digital um, advocacy platform that NHF has invested in. Um, this system has also been rolled out to, I believe, 23 or 24 of the state chapters as well. Um, again, this is a really, really neat platform that allows um, folks on the back end um, to really um, 
write messages, get uh, folks involved when an issue gets brought up. I say it's really easy on the back end because the policy experts, myself, other folks um, at NHF, um, we can talk about kind of the nitty gritty, the minutia, um, some of the, uh, um, the specifics in, in a piece of legislation. We can kind of type it all up. Again, have everything from budget scores to things like that. Again, we're not expecting most folks to know about. Um, but anyway, we're able to compose a very succinct message. Uh, then we're able to send it out um, really to our, our entire community base across the country uh, when an issue or a bill or a regulation um, is brought up. Um, this is, can also be replicated. Again, I mentioned that about 23 of the state chapters also have access to this. So this is something that they are, they'll be able to be doing on the state level as well. Um, the screen that you're seeing right now, this is a screenshot um, actually of a now ended in archive campaign, thank, thankfully. Um, as my colleague Marla mentioned earlier, uh, we advocated during Washington days through phone to action. Uh, on the skilled nursing facility bill. So you can see this was a screenshot of it. Um, and this in combination with our, um, really the amazing community advocates um, were instrumental in um, this bill being passed. But um, as you can see, I'll go through it real briefly. I mean, this is super simple. Again, um, folks on our, on our side, write up the message. Um, you as a community member, you would receive an email. It would look just like this. You would simply put in your name, address, zip code, your phone number, email. Um, the email is already written. You do have the option to add in a personal story. Um, we always encourage you to do that. But if you are busy, like everyone is now, um, you can simply just send the message. It will automatically go uh, to your two senators and to your house member as well. So again, it's a really, really neat tool. Um, that greatly benefited us in 2020. Um, and as we're still struggling um, with this unpredictable COVID nature in 2021, this is um, something that we'll be looking to, uh, to utilize quite often. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so two more slides and then we'll get to um, any questions. Um, also a part of phone to action. This is not something that the chapters have, um, although they can use the link, uh, but something else that NHF invested in is called uh, phone to action civic action center. Um, and it allows you, as you can kind of see up, up top, um, if you can, I'd be happy to send that link out to this as well. Um, but it allows you to a check to see if you're registered to vote. Um, if you are registered to vote, it will let you know um, all of your voting information, voting location, what you need to bring, what you don't need to bring um, during COVID, if you can vote by mail, if you can or can't. Um, and then also if you're not registered to vote, um, you just have to simply type in your information, then it will take you to the appropriate Secretary of State's website in your respective state, and it will get you all set up to vote. Um, I know I've heard from a few folks that um, had um, either themselves or family members who um, use this tool and they were, had never uh, been registered to vote in quite a while. Um, and it was a super simple and easy process to do. So again, this was very appropriate in 2020. Um, there are still um, a few uh, statewide elections in 2021. Um, and then it's never too early to talk about 2022 when we'll have our next um, midterm elections as well, um, where there will be um, hundreds and hundreds of elected officials on both the state, federal, and local levels that will be up for election. Um, again, if uh, you have any questions about this or if you would like the link, um, um, I'd be happy to drop it in the chat box later um, or please reach out to me. Uh, and then uh, the next slide, please. Um, okay, and then finally, uh, I just wanted to give you kind of a, a comparison. This is on that same link. Um, you just would need to click over to elected officials section. Uh, again, you just need to type in some general information and it will show you your elected officials on the federal, state and local level. Um, really wanted to highlight this because as uh, Joanna mentioned, we are um, in a brand new Congress. It's the 117th Congress. Um, there are a lot of new faces in Washington, DC. Um, not, but not only in Washington, D.C., there are a lot of new faces um, in your local state capitals, in your local governments as well. So this is a very easy, quick, and convenient way for you to see 
um, who your elected officials are, um, if the incumbent stayed in place, or if um, someone new came on board. Um, so again, uh, please utilize all of these virtual um, tools that NHF has invested in. Um, if you have any thoughts or questions or comments about it, um, I'd love to hear those. Um, happy to answer any questions now um, or can offline. And then with that, I will uh, turn it over for any questions. Great. Thanks so much, Dylan. At this time, I'd like to ask all of our panelists to turn their cameras and on and unmute themselves. We do have some questions that came in and we will uh, let you uh, jump in and answer that. Um, the first question is, um, with the new administration, how vulnerable is the Affordable Care Act and anything specific to our community? Um, sure, I'm happy to start, um, but hope that my uh, colleagues will chime in. Um, the Biden, uh, when campaigning, um, President Biden uh, frequently affirmed his support for the Affordable Care Act. You know, he kind of famously used some bad words to describe how excited he was for the passage of the ACA back in 2010 and what a big deal he thought it was. Um, so I think that he, his administration will work to shore up the ACA, um, to make it easier for people to enroll in coverage. Um, and I know that they're closely looking at, as, as I'm sure folks know, there's a case before the Supreme Court right now challenging the constitutionality of the ACA. And I know both the new Democratic leaders in Congress, as well as the Biden administration, are looking at potential steps that they could make to, um, to, to take to make that case um, moot and no longer an issue. Um, so I think we'll see a lot on the ACA front um, in the coming weeks. And we at NHF will do our best to educate the community about any policy changes that might be heading our way, you know, good or bad. And I'll just add um, a couple of things. If you put this into context of where we were four years ago into 2017, when we were also entering into a new Congress, you had a president who was hell bent on dismantling the ACA. They had control of the Senate and Joanna, did they still have control of the House? The Republicans had control of the House at the time. So you've got like a triple threat compared to what we're going into in 2021. And I'm not trying to be partisan here. I'm just trying to lay out who was very public about their opposition to the ACA and put that into context of where we are now. Because now you have a president who worked very closely with President Obama around the creation of the ACA. And you've got a Democratic controlled House and Senate, not huge majorities, but um, it is a very different context than the leadership going into the 115th Congress four years ago. So to answer the question, it's a very different dynamic in DC than it was when we saw all of these threats um, four years ago. And I, I will just add quickly onto that is that um, the Biden administration, I actually was just trying to recall in my head where it would be now, did release a, um, a health plan. And you could look more so at, in terms of what he was actually proposing and is what is being referred to as the ACA 2.0. Great. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate that. Next question comes in. Um, funding has remained flat, continues to remain flat for the hemophilia treatment centers. Will there ever be a push to increase funding for them? Maybe we can start with Joanna this time again. Sure, happy to. Yeah, I mean, the budget issues in Washington, budget has been so tight um, for many years that I know um, folks get disappointed when we're only asking for funding to be maintained rather, for, rather than asking for increases. Um, so I first wanna just kind of validate that or, or acknowledge that. Um, we are talking about um, advocating for increased funding for the federal bleeding disorders programs and we'll want to work with our federal partners to understand what they might be able to accomplish with increased funding and then we'll go to our champions in Congress and see what we can um, what we can get done this year. Um, I think with all of the spending related to COVID um, there I'm a little afraid there won't be a huge appetite for program increases in general this year, because there's a concern about, you know, spending hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars on COVID packages, which, you know, I would say are merited. Um, 
that it, it might complicate the regular funding process, but um, we will do our best to navigate that. Um, and, you know, at the very least maintain the programs that we know are so important. Thanks, Joanna. Nathan, Dylan, and Marla, and would you like to weigh in on that at all? I would just say this. Um, I hear you, whoever um, whoever uh, posed that question. We think there should be more money. We know that HDCs could put it to very good use. We know that wholeheartedly. Whenever you hear us talk about flat funding, that's a victory in DC. The COVID example is a good one. Um, there's always going to be unanticipated challenges and priorities that are going to confront Congress. As a result of those challenges, they often, if not always, are looking to cut funding wherever they can. I can tell you, if we did not have such a presence at Washington days, we would have seen that line, the funding line for HCCs, it would have been cut significantly years ago. We're in a position of playing defense from year to year. And the fact that we've been flat funded for the past few years is in and of itself a victory. I'm not trying to minimize the question because again, I hear you and I agree and trust me, we have these conversations often about when can we actually ask for an increase in funding. But what I wanna convey this afternoon is even playing defense and staying where we are in the context in DC right now, that alone is a huge victory. Yeah, yeah. point well taken, Nathan, thank you. Um, next question is uh, looking down the road and into the future regarding research for our community, like gene therapy, gene editing, cell therapy, would there be a role for our federal lawmakers? Um, Nathan, since you're up, you want to start to tackle that one? I would say yes, there's likely a role for our federal lawmakers. Do I know what that is yet? Absolutely not. And I think that's um, further challenged by the reality that gene therapy and other novel technologies are not only incredibly complicated and difficult to comprehend, they're incredibly expensive. So I don't think we're at the place of trying to identify champions on the Hill who can talk coherently and succinctly about the importance of advancing gene therapy and other novel technologies. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think that we've been able to educate members of Congress or other policymakers for that matter about the promise of what gene therapy and other novel technologies present. I think that is a point very well taken and makes our jobs all that much more difficult because that is something that we're going to have to tackle in a few years. But I think we're at the advent of those conversations rather than securing champions. I don't know, what do my colleagues think? I'll just, um, I, I agree with what you said, Nathan, and I'll just add one more thought that um, our, our pol current policies and current reimbursement rules for Medicare and Medicaid don't really contemplate the kinds of products that we see coming down the pike um, that are given maybe only one time to Nathan's point that are very expensive, that could be curative, et cetera. Um, so policymakers will need to wrestle with how these, um, these new novel technologies should be priced, how they should be covered. Um, and there will need to be some innovation, not only you know, in the labs that are leading to all these exciting advancements, but policy innovation, reimbursement innovation as well. Um, and we do plan to participate in those conversations wherever we can to make sure that the patient kind of end user voice is heard. Great, thank you. Um, another question that came in. Um, do you believe there will be a day when pre-existing conditions, lifetime caps, et cetera, won't be an issue for our community? Joanna, since I have you up, you want to you start us off on that? Oh, I mean, <laughs> that would be so great. Wouldn't that be so great? Um, you know, I think, um, as Nathan described earlier, you know, I think we're heading into a couple of years where access and the ACA should be bolstered and access should be um, facilitated. You know, I think the further away we get from um, the, you know, 2009, that before the ACA was passed, I think the harder it would be for some of those policies to come back just because they're so unpopular. Um, and I'm reminded of when I did an advocacy event um, with some teenagers with bleeding disorders who like didn't understand you, you like couldn't believe, you know, the way insurance rules used to be set before the ACA and what used to be allowed. So um, I want to say no, that we've now, it's been 11 years um, and there's so much broad support, but I, but, you know, 
I'm I'm a nervous Nelly by nature, and so um, it's something I always worry about, and something that we will always do our best to prevent from happening. Great, Nathan, Dylan, Marlon, would you like to weigh in on that? They're not as nervous as me, so. You know. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, okay. if, if pushed, I will. I will add that. Once, once people have exposure to something, and, and in most cases, in historically in health policy, once you have it, it's very, very, very hard to take it away, right? Because people have seen what benefits it has and how much it's positively or negatively, sorry, impacted their lives. And it's hard to take it away. I just will add that. Well, and I'll add a more positive note. Um, I, I agree with you entirely. And as you know, Nathan described how different the policy environment was four years ago. And if um, a bunch of policymakers who were really committed to getting rid of the ACA and those patient protections couldn't do it four years ago when we all really thought, you know, that the political environment and the stars aligned for them. Um, and the reason why they couldn't is because there was such widespread grassroots advocacy by folks in our community and others about their, you know, everyone raised their voice about how harmful they thought that would be. Um, so if, you know, that or other threats come down the pike, I have confidence in our community and many others who will raise their voices again. And, I, and I'll just piggyback on what both Joanna, Marla, and Nathan both said. Um, again, the need to educate um, a lot of these folks. And again, we had a lot of new faces in Washington, D.C. and in your state capitals as well. So please use some of the resources like the Civic Action Center where you can look up your elected officials. I know a lot of your state chapters will be doing various advocacy events, virtual state advocacy days. So the need to kind of get out in front of these new folks who maybe are not familiar with bleeding disorders um, or maybe don't have a, a huge um, knowledge in the healthcare space. Um, when you can get in front of them and introduce yourself and let them know the issues that are impacting you will go a long ways um, in us fighting some of these um, monumental issues for us. Yeah, well said, well said, thank you. Well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to join us today. We're coming, uh, we're just over that three o'clock uh, hour here on the East Coast. Um, we certainly appreciate the time and expertise. And I'd also like to thank each and every one of you for joining us. Uh, please note that this recorded webinar will be available on Friday, January 2nd at hemophilia.org. Several of our upcoming webinars are on the events tab on hemophilia.org, and we will continue to update that page as the, webinars, um, schedule, as the webinar schedule evolves. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon, and everyone have a wonderful week. Thank you so much.